latest of Adventure Climate Change Forum's monthly events. We've done these pretty much throughout lockdown, kind of getting used to being virtual now and not actually seeing people in the flesh, but still it's better than nothing. Um, tonight's theme, as you know, is a green sustainable recovery of our currently deserted town centres. And because we've got really good turnouts, so it's obviously something people really care about. So as, as always, we ask during discussion that people are constructive in their points and respectful of others, as obviously we'd, we'd normally expect people to, to be like that. And while we do have councillors present, um, some of them might speak, some of them might not. This is a non-party political event as always. So anyone being abusive or speaking over presenter will ask you um, to not do that. And then unfortunately we will remove anyone who, who persists in being disruptive or interrupting people so that everyone can actually hear properly. So please do use the chat for questions. Hopefully you, you're familiar with that. You can see the chat at the bottom. You can type in questions and comments. Thank you. So let's get on to the subject. We know town centres are facing really huge challenges. Um, some of you might not set foot in your town centre for quite a while, especially since the pandemic. But this time um, being so awful, we, we thought as a committee that it perhaps it forces us um, to look at things in new ways, appreciating what's been positive. So, for example, valuing local businesses that have really been going the extra mile and being really flexible and giving great customer service. Obviously, one of the top things is valuing improved air quality and quiet. You can hear the birds sing. You can't smell fumes because traffic's been reduced so drastically, but obviously we can see it creeping up again. So this evening we want to focus on, especially on our, how our town centres, as they revive, could be greener and more sustainable. And as we're Bedfordshire Climate Change Forum, we thought we'd hear views from two sides of the county. So we're really pleased to have Central Beds Councillor Victoria Harvey and she's here I think I can't see him because I haven't met him before but I think with um, FSB chair from Leighton Buzzard Gennaro Borelli hopefully um, Victoria is he here I can't see him at the moment yes he is he is Great. he's on the thank same page as you yes thank he's here thank you welcome welcome Gennaro um, so they're going to be um, focusing on Leighton Buzzard where they both are and after that, we'll hear from Bedford Borough Councillor Henry Van because he's portfolio holder for the town centre and he's coming on um, to us just for after another event that he's at. We're also glad to have an officer from Luton Borough Council, Sue Frost. Um, so, so Sue's listening in, um, so she, she might be able to participate in the chat if there's something that she can contribute if, there's, if there are many people from Luton. So as I say, do use the chat for helpful comments or interesting ideas or questions, and then we'll let our speakers respond afterwards at the very end. So Victoria, welcome. Would you like to kick us off? Thank you very much. Um, and I'm very honored to be invited to speak here. So thank you. Um, I'm an independent councillor for Central Bedfordshire Council for Linslade um, in Nathan Buzzard. I'm completely independent. I'm not part of the independent network because I believe the joy of being an independent is that you can work with everybody and you can only really get ch change when you bring everybody on board with you, however difficult that is, but that's the only way you can really get things to change from bitter experience. Um, but before that, I was coordinator of South Bedfordshire Friends of the Earth for about 15 years and Friends of the Earth about 20 years ago led on the shop local campaign on supporting town centres. And I have always campaigned for our town centre. We've got a very friendly town centre, lots of independent yeah. shops with people who live in the town. So going into the town is a huge social experience on market days. And I campaigned for a bus service um, and got one million pounds from DCLG in 2007 that could bring people from the new estate into the town centre and the railway station. That has proved to be very successful, cut traffic by 20% and is now running commercially, independently, without subsidy. Um, and I uh, campaigned for the market. We've okay. done a lot of uh, signs for Run, supported a lot of signage, a lot of directories for local shops. Gennaro from the FSB will fill on more on that. A lot of promoting the farmers market, having talks, explaining what the farmers were up to. 
Um, I did deliveries for some of the local farmers in the first lockdown and actually increased their turnover, even though they weren't allowed to trade. So, and it was amazing how interested people were in the stories of local farmers. People who I never thought would be interested were desperate to buy local. Um, and Leighton Buzzard is holding up well. I tried to get a pop-up shop um, in November and all the shops were let. It was impossible to find a vacant shop that we could use as a pop-up shop. So there's surprisingly enough, despite the headlines, we're holding up well. Now, there's been a lot of conversation about how we're losing re retail, um, how we need to reinvent the high street. Everything has changed. We're shopping online. And Mary Porteous was very powerful talking about how we need to reimagine shops and talking about the death of the Arcadia Empire, saying, you know, Topshop used to be an amazing place to go, but it lost its spirit. You know, a lot of the shops that have gone lo have lost a lot of their excitement. But there's something, and, and also there's a huge um, uh, revival of arts and culture. I've put one article in our local magazine about the idea of an art centre. I have been overwhelmed by emails from people who want to exhibit, by people who can't find places to exhibit, by performers, by jazz artists, huge range of people. So there is a, a bubbling demand for people to meet for culture, for arts and a range of issues. But underneath this discussion on uh, retail and town centres, there are a couple of myths that I am very keen to explode because they're getting credence. And the first one is about um, the high street dying and people don't want shops any longer and they don't want to shop online and all our shops are closing. But there's a very clear reason for that, which is the level of business tax. The retail sector accounts for 5% of gross domestic product but pays 25% of all business rates. This is from the Select Committee of the House of Commons on Communities. The hospitality sector pays 10% of the total business rate bills and represents only 3% of economic activity. Pubs account for 0.5% of the total rateable turnover and pay 2.8% of the total business rates. This is not a remotely level playing field. Amazon pays only 0.7% of its turnover in business rates. Tiny Amai, whereas Marks and Spencers pays 2%, Cine World pays 6%, and New Look pays 7%. Um, and there was a Guardian article that said that Amazon's business rate bill was just 63 million in 2018 almost 40 million less than next. This is despite Amazon reporting UK sales of nearly 8.8 .8 billion, more than double of that of next, which has 500 stores. So we're not talking about shops not wanting to be in the high street. We're not talking about people not wanting to shop in the high street. We're talking about a government policy that prices them out. Now, what's exciting is that there is a rising concern about it. Even ironically enough, supermarkets and Tesco's have got on board with this because they're feeling threatened by their online rivals. And the Treasury report um, highlights that actually business rates have become a, a very large proportion of our tax. They introduced from 8.8 .8 billion in 1990 to 27.3 billion in 2017, which was an increase of 210%. Now they should have only increased by 75% if they followed inflation. So very quietly, the treasury sneaked up business rates, which again decimated our high streets. And then there is an appalling delay in the change between rents and and business rates, because business rates are based, are set in relation to rents. But even though a huge amount of rents have been dramatically reduced, or in some cases been put to zero, business rates have not re reduced. The 2017 revaluation 
showed that more than half of retailers have pre been previously paying too much in rates. And rateable values in Newport, South Wales, will drop by 71% and in lower stock by 41%. So we are, and I think there is a case of one council that is renting to Pinelands for only a pound in rent, um, but Pinelands is still having to pay over 100,000 in business rates. So I think before we jump to the conclusion that retail in town centres is dead, we need to very seriously look at the wider picture. Then there is the subsidy ago, the hidden subsidy against high streets. First of all, we've had this huge expansion of out-of-town retail, which is marvellous because our taxes pay for all the roads. So everyone can drive there and it's unfriendly. And then you've got loneliness issues that the council and our council tax can pick up. You've got lack of health, you've got obesity and all those other issues that again, our council tax can pick up and try and remedy. So that's one. Then you have got carbon and you have got vans and you have got transport. A lot of people walk into towns or can cycle into towns. They're closed, out of town retail parks, you've got to travel. And with online shopping, you get the huge problem of um, van traffic. Now, Transport emissions are the big area that needs to be really tackled. And in central Bedfordshire, the Central Bedfordshire Council's done a brilliant baseline review for its sustainability plan. It has got a very good sustainability plan, so got to deliver it, but it's a great plan. And 39% um, of our emissions in CBC are from transport. Now, the DFT is highlighting that there's going to be a big growth in traffic. And um, what is most worrying is that van traffic is going to drive, is going to increase by 79%, whereas cars are predicted to grow by only 9%. And vans in London contribute to 15% of all traffic, and it's expected to rise to 23% of all traffic by 2040. Particularly as you've got vans stopping, parking in the road, um, uh, and as they deliver, you are going to get increasing problems with congestion and with carbon. And moreover, people can argue, well, it's so marvellous, it's saving you doing a car journey. But they could be, well, stopping you doing a cycling journey or a walking journey. But also, Amazon tends to do six different deliveries rather than one total shop for you. So it's not like getting one mass delivery of everything. It's getting it's six different drop-offs. Packaging uh, is the other issue. There's been there a report go. from, sorry. Uh, there's been a report from Oceana saying that Amazon generated an ex estimated 465 million kilograms of plastic packaging in a year. And e-commerce in the UK produces 73.1 million kilograms of plastic annually. That has to be dealt with by councils, possibly end up in the lovely Cavanta incinerator, as I with heavy irony. But we are creating a massive problem for ourselves that we are having to cover for online shopping. I also mean to say that online doesn't have its role, but it, it needs to be looked through very carefully. Now, with 30% of all car journeys are usually less than one kilometre, we have this enormous chance to change our cities. And Waltham Forest has led the way by doing a big project uh, encouraging walking and cycling. They managed to uh, deliver cycle training to 15,000 people. They got an increase in life expectancy of between seven to nine months for residents, and they improved air quality due to reduction in NO2 by between 15 to 25 percent. And Greater Manchester has just embarked on their B network vision, where they're doing a wonderful and um, longest planned walking and cycling network in the UK. 
and the program costs 1.5 billion. This is Manchester on a huge scale, but the returns are 6 billion. So if we were to do smaller schemes in our areas, we are getting a one to six return, which is quite impressive. They are planning to get 45,000 cars off the road and over a million uh, pounds in economic benefits. Now, when I worked on the bus service I helped introduce in 2007, we cut traffic from the new estate by 20%. That was only with a regular half hour bus service and really good promotion and real reliability. So some really forward looking active investment can bring back those very, very significant returns. And it is a challenge because we've got to work on our councils to look across the across the different areas. So if you're dealing with transport, you've also kept, got to capture air quality benefits, health benefits, and a range of other benefits with the biodiversity, mental health. And that, that's a new way of thinking. It's coming in with the sustainability goals. It's in Central Bedfordshire Council's plan, but it's going to take a while for people to think laterally. Um, one of the other big um, interests that I've uh, really come across is the increased interest in greening in urban areas. Now it is predicted that we're going to increasingly suffer from urban heat. Now it is lovely coming out into public spaces, we will be crazy to meet up with each other, but if it's too hot, something we need shade. And the uh, government's predicting that, uh, well, at the moment, 3,000 people a year die from heat effects, and they're predicting by 2040 it will be 7,000 a year. So we, this is a chance to think very seriously about biodiversity within our towns, how we can have more, um, more creepers growing up walls that don't harm the uh, fabric, how we can have uh, trees that don't cause problems and don't call, cause subsidence, and how we can generally get more shade and all the benefits of having growing things for our quality and for um, just health and enjoyment. Now, um, Gennaro from the FSB is going to talk um, about what's practically going on and a lot of exciting new things that he's been working on in Nathan Buzzard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. And thank you, Lucy, for inviting me and having me along at this evening's meeting. My name is Gennaro Borelli. Um, I live and own and run a business in Leighton Buzzard. I'm also the chair of the Federation of Small Business SIG Group, which stands for Special Interest Group, um, which um, has local FSB members and business owners working together in the Leighton Buzzard and Linslate area. And obviously we have the backing of the National Federation of Small Business who are always speaking with their members to see what needs to be done in a practical way to help the small independent businesses across the country. They lobby central government, they put proposals forward, um, but the SIG group is specifically focused on how and what we can do um, in our town in Leighton Buzzard and Linsley. And so what we have been doing and what we do is work in partnership with other community groups. We very much believe that it's um, very important to cultivate um, friendship and good working practices with other community groups and investing in those grassroots projects um, and also working with the town council and central beds council. Um, so we've done lots of lovely things to encourage people to come into our town centres. Um, even though we've had a town that's been growing rapidly, we believe in community cohesion and also promoting all the benefits of our town centre and in particular our um, heritage of the town, our 
markets and the um, high percentage of small independent businesses that we have in our town alongside the chains. We, we campaign as well. We campaigned against the uh, retail park, um, which sadly got the go ahead from Central Beds Council on the edge of our town on an industrial estate. We believe that that has had a detrimental effect on footfall in our town centre. Um, and it's also taken away some vital uh, industrial land as well. So land that could have been used to provide some uh, jobs for firms relocating to the area looking for um, industrial land and units with good connectivity because of the um, close links to the M1. So other things that we've done, we put on events in the town, um, such as Independence Day, which celebrates our uh, independent businesses in the town alongside our market. We do um, a three-day Christmas festival, which is the only three-day Christmas festival um, for miles around. We do this in partnership with our town council and for um, a relative small amount of money, I think we put on a fantastic event which attracts thousands of people um, from all over the area to come into our town. Uh, we support Small Business Saturday, which is another national campaign, which obviously encourages people to uh, think about um, shopping locally, buying from their small local independent businesses and local producers, many of which can provide a bespoke service, many unique bespoke products as well. Um, and, and that also helps lots of new start businesses as well. And following on a bit from what Councillor Harvey was saying, uh, we believe the Federation of Small Business believes that um, there's a very, very good opportunity once this lockdown eases, we could see um, lots of new startup businesses taking off. Even people that sadly perhaps have been made redundant, may have some redundancy money that they want to um, utilize to um, launch um, their own business. And we need to make sure that we can provide them and help them um, to really take off and get going. And we know that small independent businesses collectively employ more people per square foot of retail space um, than all of the other big chains across the country. So we collectively make a huge difference to the economy in the jobs market and tax revenue for, for the exchequer. Um, but what we're also looking at are other opportunities. And that is how can businesses take advantage of um, the change in situation which has come about from COVID? And how can we do that in an environmentally friendly, sustainable way? We don't want to go back to how things were and this is we're looking at this as a positive opportunity so we do have some local politicians who believe that um, shopping habits have changed forever for the good and they believe that everything is going to go online and therefore there's no need to invest in our town centers and support the small independent businesses that are there um, and they because they think everything's going to be done online and by Amazon. And yes, we know that that has happened during the lockdowns and the pandemic. And this is one of the reasons why we put a proposal to the town council, Lake Ninsley Town Council, and we were successful in getting a uh, grant which helped us to launch a brand new website in the town which specifically promotes our many, many small independent businesses. Um, and we used a local company 
alpha marketing. And in a very short period of time, we managed to get the website launched with over 100 businesses listed on there. These are all small local independents that can be easily found all in one place so that we're giving our local residents a choice. They don't have to just use Amazon. They can also support their small independents and find them all in one place, easily contactable and interact with them. Now, whether they wanna phone them up and speak to someone over the phone and ask about specific product or service, whether they want to arrange a call and collect or click and collect. Many of these small independent businesses are providing a free local delivery service. Um, but what we have found is that where that is available to local residents, then local residents which would much prefer to continue to support their small local businesses. And our next step now, the next phase of this website is that we are going to be setting up an e-commerce platform, which is gonna be bolted onto this website, which will allow local residents to uh, shop with these um, independent businesses. They can purchase multiple products from different businesses and pay for it all in one transaction, making it very easy. And we've already been in talks with some senior Central Beds Council officers about the possibility of setting up a delivery service across our town. But not just any old delivery service, what we want to do is do it in an environmentally friendly way. As Councillor Harvey was saying earlier on, we've seen loads of delivery vans, DPD, DHL, Amazon, um, all over the town, buzzing around, diesel vans doing their deliveries. What we want to do um, is to set up a delivery service using e-cargo bikes. Now, if you look at um, towns and cities across Europe that have already set up schemes like this, they are proven to be very, very successful. And e-cargo bikes, something that are um, cheaper to buy than, say, a, a new van. You don't need to worry about um, the huge running costs. And it makes it a lot easier for us to be able to start off with local volunteers, provided that we can work with central beds and use um, some of their assets or land in the town centre to make it uh, an accessible place for people to be able to pick up the e-cargo bikes when they're doing deliveries. Um, there are places in our town that have solar panels on their roofs that are owned by central beds. So potentially if we could have a safe storage place for these e-cargo bikes, they could also um, tap into that um, electricity which is being generated by the solar panels um, which makes it a really, really good environmental friendly project. Um, these e-cargo bikes could be, um, they could have the, they could be sponsored by local businesses. And um, we've already been working on branding across the town with our local authorities, which very much hammers home that message of shop local, support local. And this is the kind of thing that we would look to be doing. Um, and the e-cargo bikes are, are fantastic because I mean, they can carry as much as three times their weight, depending on the size of bike, they can carry as much as 75 kilos in one journey. And you, in terms of, people that could ride the bikes, they don't all have to hold a, uh, a driving license, for example. So again, it makes it easier to tap into local volunteers, people that perhaps um, of a certain age might be retired, some people might be between jobs. So you can have lots of people that could help out with this scheme. And our plan would be to charge uh, a nominal fee for each delivery to the customer. 
and that money could go directly to the person who's helping out with doing deliveries. Um, so it's a, it's a really, really um, innovative idea. And these are the kind of things that we need to be thinking about um, in order to be able to um, help local businesses as we emerge from this pandemic. So it's not just about simply switching everything to online, and but it's providing choices for local residents and customers and thinking about how we can do it in an environmentally friendly way. And incidentally, our town, Leighton Buzzard and Linslade, is, um, is known as a fair trade town. We've had the fair trade status for over 10 years in our town. And it's something that we're very, very proud of. Many of our businesses use fair trade products and uh, including myself. And, um, and, and what you'll find is, is that many of the small independent businesses are listening to their customers and they're hearing very much what their customers want. And that is for, um, they're becoming more environmentally uh, conscientious about climate change, about uh, packaging, uh, vegan friendly products. Um, there's, we have a number of businesses in our town and even market traders that are now encouraging people to bring their own containers to refill a variety of different products so that we are cutting down on packaging and waste. And we've even got um, a scheme in our town centre on market days where um, crisp packets, empty crisp packets can be brought in and collected in a container um, and is sent to um, a company which specifically recycles crisp packets because we know that these are one of the things that our local authority unfortunately cannot recycle even though people put them in their orange bins thinking that they're doing a good thing but it's one of those plastics that cannot be recycled so we're looking at all of these innovative ways to encourage people to shop locally and uh, we're working with our local authorities and we do need our local authorities to help us to provide us with the infrastructure and to help facilitate the kind of proposals that we are putting forward. Um, and for we've already shown that for a relative small amount of money, we can deliver a big but a bang for the buck, if you like, for local authorities. And if this project takes off, then is something that can be scaled up very quickly and very easily. And there's no reason at all why Central Beds couldn't replicate this across the whole of Central Bedfordshire and our other towns, such as Dunstable and Ampdill and Flittig and, and, so, and uh, Sandy uh, and so on. And we're very, very happy to work with other towns in Bedfordshire and share what we've been doing um and definitely i would recommend as much as possible working with as many community groups in every town and looking at lots of different um, national campaigns that are going on around the country and supporting those campaigns because that allows an opportunity for the businesses and the community to interact with one another and um, remind people of the uniqueness of what all these individual businesses can bring to their towns, which is something that you do not get from retail parks or from big chains. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Gennaro and Victoria. That was really useful, really good to have a perspective from the local authority point, local authority point of view and from um, business point of view as well really creative ideas as well so bedford is is quite a bit different from leighton buzzard but that's all to the good because we have things to share and we have contrast too um so next we've got um councillor henry van who i have it on good authority has just come from singing somewhere um so henry is um colin i think you've made henry co-host so that he can share 
Oh, okay. Um, I haven't actually, works? but uh, I can do that um, if you'd like that. Whatever works for you. Um, I mean, I had a few slides, but I, I, I wonder, um, I will skip through them incredibly quickly if that's all right. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Okay, I'm using the, I'm getting some nods, good. Um, you should um, be able to uh, show your presentation now, Henry. Great, fabulous. Um, I will just have to open it as well um, and get myself sorted. Um, I, just before I do that, um, I, um, yes, I wasn't actually singing live anywhere because sadly the, a, a lot of the singing opportunities for us together as a choir are not quite so <laughs> available as they usually are during, uh, during lockdown, but we, are, we have done some virtual singing, so I think it may have been on Look East, but I was at an executive meeting earlier, which is where I've just come from. Um, but thank you. I'm so grateful to be invited, actually. It's, it's, a, it's, it's really glad to be here and so many people here as well and I know we all I mean I think it, it should go without saying that we all care passionately about our town centres um, and about shopping local um, and about doing all of what we can to support our independence. Um, I just wanted to start I hadn't planned this in, uh, in, in the presentation because um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about a few things we're up to locally in Bedford specifically focused on the environment rather than that sort of broader shop local thing although you know I could talk about markets and everything else but I thought I'd um, just echo the comments around business rates reform um, as well from is it Councillor Harvey because um, I because I sort of um, completely agree with that and the way um, the way business rates works the way business rates reform works the way um, discretionary support from the government has worked as well during COVID um, that is definitely one of the things that is challenging some of the smaller businesses there once you're in a property that's worth this much and they tell you it's worth that much and you have to pay business rates on it. Well, as you say, if you've got a pound, a pound and paying one pound rent, but actually then having to pay, you know, business rates on top of that, whatever happens, that clearly creates a, an imbalance in the playing field. Um, so there are massive national challenges going on. I'd agree that retail alone isn't the future. I think we all know that it's got to be experiences. It's got to be people want to visit. Um, I'd agree, actually, with some of the comments in the chat about it's got to be the environment. It's got to be that that sort of um, beautiful um, aspect of visiting somewhere and actually going to visit to meet people. And and I think, you know, for, from Bedford's perspective, the one thing that came out through our town centre plan consultation um, overwhelmingly was the importance of the embankment and, um, and that sort of riverside environment. Um, but I would also say on the retail side of things that um, I have found during lockdown certainly and even before then some of our independents and we're more than 60 percent independents in Bedford a, a, a very high percentage um, relative to, to sort of neighbours although I don't have figures for Leighton Buzzard so I'm not trying to compete with Leighton Buzzard there because we've heard such wonderful things um, but 60 um, percent independence in, in, in Bedford Town Centre and, and I found that they have been fleet of foot and able to adapt quickly my worry is that the long-term nature of the pandemic and the restrictions is really sort of hurting an independent business which maybe doesn't have that massive weight of a corporate entity behind it giving it sort of support over this time although as we've seen even even, even those larger larger retailers have struggled and in some cases um, gone into administration um, and I do completely agree as well sorry just to say with um, what Hazira posted in the, in the chat about the fact that we need we need a balance of things that are affordable and things that people can access in a town centre that everybody can access um, in terms of opening up our town centres to all but with that in mind and aware of the time and wanting to not um, waste your time. You can now decide whether you think I'm any good as an online teacher because I am a teacher and I have had to be teaching all of my lessons online. So hopefully you can see my screen. Um, I'm getting a nod from Lucy. I can see some faces, but not all. And I'm not a, I'm not a cat was the other thing that I needed to mention. But um, I just thought it'd be useful to just point people in directions, really, because I'm not, this is a forum, right? And, uh, and I don't think we're going to have every answer today. And I think people might go away and have ideas afterwards, as well as a discussion. And I really want people to feel able to get in touch with myself, either Lucy, you, you'll have my contact details anyway, but they're very easy to find. If people have other ideas that come out of this, I mean, things like e-cargo bikes were mentioned, we've just got six in um, to, um, to Bedford um, to use to help support local businesses and help um, move stuff around in a more environment environmentally friendly way. And I must admit, when Councillor Harvey started talking about the peril of vans, I did start to feel slightly victim victimised, but um, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure that was spelled differently <laughs> to my surname. So I just, um, our town centre plan um, was published um, last year. It is um, 
freely available online. You literally just need to type in Bedford Town Centre Plan. It has a vision. It talks about sustainability. It talks about the environment. It talks about encouraging people into the town centre. It talks about events as well and br local events to bring people in. I think we do want people to shop in the town centre um, above all because actually that is a greener place to go and shop, isn't it? It's, you know, it's local. If, if transport links are good enough and if connectivity is good enough, as you can see, that's one of the main themes we identified for reform in the town centre plan. And sorry, it's very small um, print there, <laughs> but I thought I'd just try and pack it on a slide and see, see see what people thought. But I highlighted a few that I think hopefully um, give you some idea of what we're looking at. So um, when I say future projects there, we may be in discussions at any one time with, um, you know, there's a big project being looked at around, I'm sure you, people in Bedford will be aware, around BPHA, their tower blocks and um, the police station site is all part of that. And it's all sort of under really early discussions at the moment. At the same time, there's um, uh, master plans in place for um, the area just around Borough Hall to the south, if you know um, Borough Hall well, and there are master plans for Ford End Road as well. All of those elements need to have, um, even in those early discussions, if you like, when you're just talking to um, somebody who wants to invest in an area, need to have the environment at the heart of it. And that's something which we regularly raise in conversation with developers. We're not, you know, the, the council doesn't have the money to throw at things in the way that perhaps um, we used to have a better resource, but we're down, you know, about 24 million from where we were um, five years ago. So um, developing projects from the Bedford Council, uh, Bedford Borough Council Town Centre Priority Fund I'll come on to. Um, the coach friendly state is interesting because I'm not sure it even exists anymore, but we have introduced coach parking bays at two new strategic points around the town centre to encourage um, bigger trips to come. Um, I'm seeing chats as well, so I might keep an eye on the chat if that's OK. Um, but um, I think um, improving the cycle network as well, you can see is there um, strategic development for the centre of town as part of the new local plan. And I'll come on to that in a minute. But these are the sort of bits I just pulled out. But really, um, a sustainable recovery and a sustainable town centre has to be at the heart, I think, of what we what we do. So this is just touching on the sort of themes of the of the town centre plan, if you like. I thought I'd throw the local plan in here as well anyway, because people often say, what about consultation? And the town centre plan, which was here, had 2000 responses plus to the consultation. The local plan, um, which we're going through the process of adopting a new local plan at the moment, um, does talk in that last paragraph on the slide, you can see town centre wide range of uses. And it talks about diverse and sustainable use as well, which was something which has been touched on already, but also um, <laughs> avoiding areas of high flood risk, which is something which Bedford Borough Councillors, I know we will all um, have in our minds at the moment. Um, and Lucy, I know your ward obviously right uh, straddling the river uh, <laughs> in terms of um, your awareness there, but also the, the, the very start of that plan around greener, more sustainable and more attractive place to live is, is actually at the heart of that local plan. So I just thought, because people talked about vision and strategy, and if it's not in your local plan, it's hard to argue with the developer that it has to be there. But if it is in your local plan, then you can have the planning policies in place that then enable you to steer. It's a bit like steering. An oil tank is not the best um, analogy, is it, for uh, for us in a climate change forum? But um, <laughs> you can steer the large vehicle that's cumbersome. Um, very slowly with some of these policies, but you have to do that um, if you want to make a change. I thought I'd touch on as well, the, 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 I'm going to touch on two other things really, and um, because I, as I say, I'm mindful of time, but um, the town deal is an opportunity to bid for £25 million. Um, Bedford was selected as one of the places to bid. Um, I'm sure it was nothing to do with us being a marginal seat, but um, we have put forward a bid um, up to almost the maximum that we could bid for. Um, and I just wanted to draw out the, you know, the, the list of projects there, obviously digital co connectivity is important, but also improving cycle and pedestrian infrastructure, improving some of those junctions that become choke points around a town center, like the top end of the high street as well, that's transporting Bedford 2030 and supporting, um, it's not just cyclists, but it's pedestrians as well, actually, because they are the green, ways to move around, if you like. They're environmentally sustainable, pedestrians and cyclists, and trying to um, adapt the town centre in that way and make it an attractive place to shop. Um, that, just to say, the town deal came through um, that town centre consultation that I've talked about before, and a, huge, a host of sort of processes that we had to go through um, with central government, including setting up a town deal board, which was ably chaired by 
um, Sam Laycock, who chairs our business improvement district. Um, but we also then um, received a million pounds and got told we had to decide what we wanted to spend it in um, about uh, uh, the period of a month. Um, so <laughs> there wasn't much time to decide what to do with it. Um, and um, clearly cycling enhancements, routes map, route, route maps, um, secure parking for cyclists as well was one of the projects that was put forward. These are things that were deliverable within the time frame. So all of these need to be done by the end of March, which is really um, coming upon us really quite quickly. Um, but some of the other work there around um, town events infrastructure and supporting drop curbs to make the town centre more accessible, not just to pedestrians, but um, pedestrians who may be less able on wheelchairs with prams, all that um, sort of accessibility is at the heart of what, um, what an inclusive Bedford is about, really. I could go on and on about the wider context. I thought I wouldn't. Um, LED lighting, electric vehicle charging points, um, shorter car journeys, actually. It requires some quite clever planning sometimes and sometimes some um, less helpful ideas, but um, some good planning to make sure that car routes are shorter. I've mentioned the electric cargo carts. Um, and the final thing I wanted to finish on, really, and I'll stop sharing my screen now, um, we also have a um, town centre priority fund, um, which... Um, which I think is there to attract investment, I think it's fair to say, but also to encourage bids from community groups, from any, you know, even, you know, the Climate Change Forum or anyone who wants to hold events in the town centre when they're happening again. I mean, this is COVID pandemic accepting, but also um, an exciting project, hopefully to support a new green wall um, and to support different sort of projects that come forward. Now, a lot of them have been funded by the council um, or organised by the council rather at the moment, they're all funded by the council, um, but this priority fund is there to be bid for and we do want people to have a think about if there are projects if there's something they want to run if they think they need an e-cargo bike and there's an opportunity to bring that into the town center on top of the six the council's already got um, and that sort of project I just want to flag that because if people have ideas um, if there was a sustainable living you know event in the town center or Harper Square or something like that that could get support through the town center priority fund and it's there to support people shopping local but also all the other initiatives that might be around. Thank you Henry Sorry. that was really useful a whistle stop tour of everything that's happening in Bedford and in the pipeline so thank you very much for filling everybody in um so we've had some sort of quite different things coming from different towns in Bedfordshire um large and small and we've got quite a few questions so we've got quite a few questions about um well a few comments on business rates um and difference between local and online and how the the comparisons can be a little bit difficult, but most people seem to be thinking reform is needed. And obviously that comes down to national um, government. Um, now my cursor has decided to um, freeze. There is a question. Sorry, excuse me, my cursor is now not working. Um, do we have a vision, says Josephine, for the town centre? I think we've heard quite a lot, haven't we? Is there anything um, in terms of vi vision and strategy that can turn things around and drive creativity? I think we've heard, hopefully, Josephine, you feel that from both or all three speakers, we've heard quite a bit about their vision and creativity. Is there anything else, um, Victoria or Henry? or Gennaro having finished speaking, but is there anything else you'd like to reflect on about vision and creativity? Victoria, you look like you might want to say something. Yes, I'm, I'm, I think I've just got to explain. I've got, having been campaigning on this since 2005, and I'm still looking at government documents from 2005 about town centres and visioning and the green future, I've slightly lost my faith in visions because you can sometimes spend ages on strategies and actually getting something delivered is a whole different issue. And one of the ways I've realised the most effective way of campaigning is to do something as a community group, get the council involved, and that actually tends to change minds and make things happen faster than all the lo other lobbying in the world. But for vision, there is, you know, we need to be... I don't know if anyone's seen any of the work of Bill Dunster, 
who's a marvelous zero carbon architect. And you can get wonderful things like um, translucent roofs that are solar panels at the same time. So considering we get a lot of rain in this country, you can have lovely covered spaces with plants inside with the daylight coming through that is also creating energy. He's also done wonderful things of seats with um, like little uh, roofs above them that are solar panels where you can charge your electric bikes. Um, we want to be having wonderful local food coming in, really beautiful planting. Why have we got so much hideous brickwork everywhere? No one is really investing in how you get things growing up the sides of um, uh, houses. There are issues with ivy. It works in some places. Green walls are very expensive, but why is nobody really investing in that? We could, through a mixture of shrubs and planting and doing things like Singapore have done when they've got those amazing steel structures that have got stuff growing up, we could have these wonderful urban a kind of rainforest that we live in. London has got more bees virtually than anywhere else because it's got so many roof gardens. So, and also I've just seen, I think it's Copenhagen, where they're removing parking and near a student place and having more seats. I mean, you've got, you've got to do it the right way around. You've got to give people a really good alternative to having a car. There's nothing worse than lugging heavy shopping home. As I've done it many times. You've got to really think it through so it's easier to be green than not be green. But wouldn't it be lovely instead of all the space given to cars and roads that you have more places to sit and talk, you have more flowers, you have more plants, you have more activities. We give up so much public space at huge taxpayer expense to the car. Why can't we start reclaiming it? So I think we really need to look ahead as a vision of how we want to interact, what green energy means, all its opportunities, and also having hubs and training. We've got to completely retrofit our houses in the next 10 years. Um, we need 2.5 million heat pumps in the UK. Why on earth aren't we building them in Bedfordshire? Why haven't we got green skill hubs in our town centres? So I think the vision can be fantastic, but there are a lot of good papers. What we need to do is start doing a few of the basics, and that's where the local FSB and LB First of Gennaro have been so good. They've put on the events, they've got the website up, even though it nearly killed them doing it. You know, they've done all these really practical things, and that creates the energy. Thank you. Thanks, Victoria. I, th I think we all agree that. Um this pandemic devastating but has also been an engine for creativity in many ways people doing things dramatically different for um to the benefit of many people but not all people at the moment thanks victoria so we have various questions about natural capital and biodiversity um Henry or Gennaro? I know, Victoria, you've already said quite a bit about this and you have a lot of knowledge in the area. Henry, do you want to add anything? Obviously, with all this town centre refurb, are we going to have the same amount of um, brick and stone and <laughs> paving? Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, um, there are going to be more trees down the Heinz High Street as a result of the High Street Heritage Action Zone and um, um, uh, transporting Bedford project to one lane, the high street. So that that is bringing more green into the town centre on a sort of full stop basis, if you like. Um, so in the sense of reclaiming space from the cars, I guess, to some extent that is, but that's, and, and it's to support pedestrians use. Um, I mean, the feedback from the businesses has been good so far um, in terms of how the one lane, the sort of temporary experiment worked, if you like, and that was to aid social distancing during um, um, I'm going to have to do written answers to some of Joanne's questions, I'm afraid, because I'm not sure what percentage of the removed brickwork and paving is being reused, but I will look it up if you like, um, if I can take some of those away. Um, so, so I think, um, so, so I think in terms of green overall, yes, um, we do want to see more green space. And actually, sometimes some of the raised planters um, end up being huge concrete blocks 
if you like, dividing up open spaces where people could be walking, where actually some lower space, some grasses, all of this sort of thing, and having a having a sensible strategy for environmentally sustainable planting um, in town centres is on the radar for the local plan as well. Because um, I think you're absolutely right, and it's one of the things being worked on at the moment by officers, um, and it's one of the things that came through in the sort of first round if you like of consultation on the on, on the local plan clearly some of these are long-term things because they come in with with costs in terms of biodiversity as well um yes um i think there are a number of projects we're planning to do around bees and that sort of thing which which is going to be there um and in terms of promoting biodiversity more generally as well and continuing to invest in our green spaces and actually support them because they are an element of our budget that we continue to spend as a local authority and actually i think we've all noticed during lockdown um how people are appreciating some of our green spaces perhaps more than they previously did um you know and i think that's that can only be a good thing i think people will realize the value of value of that um so i, I don't know whether that answers but hopefully it gives a flavor of an answer um to to that point thanks henry yes i think i think people have been appreciating um green space is more taking more of an interest in learning about the natural environment rather than just a sort of manicured local um, man-made environment that might look green with a small g but not be green. Um, so Hazira has a question about local and independent retailers. She says, especially with regard to food, they are not always affordable to a segment of people who get better deals for their families through bulk food shopping or deals at supermarkets. How can town centres compete in terms of the prices um, with large supermarkets and online retailers to make it more affordable? I, I mean, I don't know whether it's worth saying and whether it's whether I can say something, Lucy, but I was thinking about that because I completely agree with Hazira's point. We need to be careful about saying everybody needs to buy this type of thing and um, go to this type of shop, because if you start having that kind of um, constraining approach, then you don't do what Victoria was saying earlier, um, which was um, bringing people with us on the journey to a more sustainable way of living, which I think is really important. Um, so the one thing I did want to mention is that um, is that there were calls at the start of the first lockdown, I think, for Bedford to close the market completely and not have the market open at all, whilst our supermarkets and outer town shopping centres obviously just carried on operating. And we pushed back very firmly on that. Um, clearly, only essential stores were allowed to open, etc. Um, but our food market and the, and, and the food stalls were retained in the town centre because actually for a lot of people those are an affordable place to go um, and buy eggs from the egg um, shop if you all know her um, and <laughs> and that sort of thing is an environmental uh, often I find a more sustainable way of shopping and certainly um, you can also walk there from most places in Bedford I think. Thanks Henry. Victoria I think you've made a comment about price haven't you you've done a study Yes, uh, with South Bedfordshire Friends of the Earth, we did a lot of price comparisons. So we did the market and the farmer's market. And uh, with Aldi, Tesco and Morrison's. Now, yeah, there were some things they were more expensive on. But we got things like the pears in the market were 40p cheaper per kilo than Tesco. Some things were cheaper than Aldi. I know Aldi does do some very cheap some very cheap things but even so some veg on the market were cheaper uh meat was comparable with aldi there's a lovely farmer near bedford near kim bolton morgan Pell. um and we've been around his farm lovely trees very friendly and um but that was the same price some of it was the same price as Aldi. And once you got onto something that wasn't the extra value, Tesco extra value or the cheapest, and moved towards something that was slightly more quality, it came in as miles cheaper. I've got all the hesitations of things like Borough Market, where it's incredibly expensive, and there are a lot of local shops where it's very expensive. And I cannot stand the expensive green world. You know, I, I can't afford to buy organic. But I, some of the food to our veg store comes from local Bedfordshire farms, and I've checked what pesticides are used on those farms. So um, I, I think local, with the right support, can work out as cheaper. Thanks, Victoria. Good study. And, and I suppose the other issue is time, that a lot of people don't have the 
the time to be shopping around and going to different places. They've got really limited time because of long hours and caring responsibilities. And for them to have to go to various outlets is tricky, but. Yeah, but I, I think Gennaro's got something to add. Gennaro, sorry. That's okay. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, just a couple of points, really. Um, firstly, I think um, Henry was was quite right. You know, the pandemic, what has what the pandemic has done across the country is thrown up a lot of inequalities across the board. Um, what the small independent businesses have been arguing for is a fair representation and a level playing field. And often we find that the bigger retailers get get first pick of everything you know in the run of the mill and we often find that whether it's central government or local authorities policies can maybe not um maybe not in a deliberate way but inadvertently be um counterproductive shall we say for the small businesses and markets um, and and so you know we know that obviously the supermarkets have, have raked in huge profits um, for example apart from the Amazons and, and everyone else um, and of course you know whilst you've got an independent small independent card shop for example that's had to close or a market trader that would have a card stall there you can go into Tesco's or any other supermarket and you know, have your choice of Valentine's cards and lots of other products associated with that, for example. Would they be considered to be essential goods? Not really. How safe are they in terms of being a safe environment for people to shop in when we're talking about the various variants that are coming out of COVID-19 that spread a lot more uh, easier than, than what we thought? compared to shopping at an open air market, for example. So there are lots of things we have to take into account. And, you know, the small businesses have really had the brunt of the kind of policies that have been enacted. And we've all played our part and we've all acted responsibly. Um, I can assure you that certainly in Lincoln Buzzard, many of the small independent businesses spent a great deal of time money and effort making sure that their business premises were COVID safe for their customers because they wanted their customers to feel confident to be able to come back into the town and be able to go into their premises and shop with them. Um, I run a hair salon so you can imagine that close interaction with our customers. We, we did everything we possibly could to implement uh, policies to make sure that our customers felt 100% safe when they were coming into town and when they came into our premises as well. And we've done an awful lot of work in, in our salon to make sure that our business is a lot more environmentally friendly. Um, we've retrospectively um, done upgraded the premises the lighting, we've got triple glazing installed, we've got solar panels on the roof, we've got water saving devices, we've got a thermodynamics hot water system, which heats up the hot water with an outdoor panel. Um, our products are organic products that are manufactured here in the UK. They're vegan friendly, they are fair trade, they are, um, the, the packaging is made from recycled plastics and is 100% recyclable. We offer a refill system. We have a back garden, a small courtyard back garden, which we've tried to uh, plant lots of bee friendly uh, plants there because there's a church not very far away from us and they have beehives there. So it's about providing these kind of uh, oasis for bees and pollinators within our urban town centers so and we recycle a lot of things as well as a business so as a small independent business uh, I'm just sharing some of the things that we've done in in our uh, business and as an example to other businesses in our town 
and how we can all play our part in becoming more environmentally friendly and also playing our part in the wider community. And, you know, as I said, our customers are becoming a lot more aware of what's happening in the world and they are driving with how they spend their money and what they demand, the changes and businesses that are savvy enough are having to adapt. And from the Federation of Small Business, this is why we see that there are opportunities. We think that there, there's gonna be, there will be a bounce back. You know, people, yes, may have changed their shopping habits, but at the end of the day, everyone has missed that human interaction with our family and friends. They're gonna to want to come back into our town centers and they're gonna to want to spend time with friends and family to eat, drink and socialize. And so what Councillor Harvey was talking about is for the local authorities to uh, liaise with community groups and with their residents to find out what they want and make sure that they can facilitate to make sure that our town centers are accessible and that they are places where people want to be and spend time. So whether we provide uh, more outdoor seating, whether we can provide, um, as our town center does in Leighton Buzzard, free Wi-Fi, for example. Um, uh, with pedestrianization, there's the opportunity to put on more open air events because people are looking for entertainment as well, making sure that we keep our uh, park in good order um, you know these are all important things which are going to encourage people to come back into our towns uh, and just one last thing if I may Lucy one thing that we've just done recently is that we we responded to the government consultation um, which ended at the end of January with regards to proposals where they are looking to change um, the uh, use of commercial properties so that um, either private landlords or property developers can come in and take over these empty units and change them into residential units without any planning permission whatsoever and even this can happen even in conservation areas and where there are, um, like in our town centre, we have a large proportion of grade two listed buildings and, and it could drastically change our traditional um, market town. And without any um, planning permission being sought, it leaves it wide open to some unscrupulous um, developers potentially to convert these buildings into quite low grade shoddy um uh properties for people to rent and we we need to be careful that we don't end up with slum dwellings right in our town centers and what we've seen in Leighton buzzard even during this um the, these lockdowns and during the pandemic is that the small vacant um units have been taken up by new startup businesses and we don't want to take away the opportunity of allowing other businesses to open up in our town centres by having some of these properties being converted into low grade um, housing developments with a lack of amenities and facilities. Thanks, Janara. You've raised a lot of really important issues there and I think Henry wants to come in. I just wanted to add on. Point. That if I can just very quickly and then I think Joanne is waving at you as well. Um, so <laughs> um, just on the um, on the point about planning policy, Janara, I, I completely agree. Um, planning permission is not a sort of ugly word and actually requiring residential in town to get planning permission is about making sure that it's fit to live in and actually about planning retail space and not losing, and I say retail, but actually it could be a dance studio, it could be a yoga club, it could be a pop-up shop, it could be a, 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 a garden, a, a mini garden center, right? I mean, in the town center, all of these things that could be used in that space are at risk of being lost long term if there is a kind of um, permitted development right which there is in our town centers at the moment in a lot of ways um, except for sort of some of the some of the active frontage I think we, we tend to call it um, in terms of so so I'm very keen to support sort of above ground level residential development because you do get people moving into an area I think we you know there's the huge success of the eagle 
um, bookshop as well in Bedford, which has flats above it, but actually downstairs there's a bookshop and an art gallery, which I think is a you know not 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 a bad model in terms of sustainability and in terms of um, bringing people into the town centre in a residential sense. So I don't disagree with residential, but I think Janari, you're right in terms of planning and maintaining active frontage that people want to walk around and use and discover a new independent they never knew existed when they turned the corner you know which is something you can't get at Milton Keynes sorry um so um you know that that's the excitement of shopping in a market town or a historical town or a place with grade two listed buildings and we we are sometimes at risk of losing that and I do think we need to protect um office space as well because that's the bread and butter during the day the daytime footfall in the week and residential doesn't provide that in the same way necessarily sorry just Thanks, Henry. Um, we've had quite a few questions re relating to businesses large and small. I think I think most of you would agree that we need, Stephen said, we need larger anchor stores to help attract business as well. So a mixture of stores. I think we would probably agree that that we need different sizes of businesses, don't we, for a healthy, a healthy balance. Um, a quick question from Poonam Chand. Poonam says, is there a green accreditation for hospitality that we can commit to? Someone might have answered this, actually. Rachel, I wonder if you can answer this, actually. Do you know the answer? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, sorry, what was the question again? Is, um, Poonam says, is there a green accreditation for hospitality that we can commit to? Um, there isn't anything uh, specific uh, in existence, but I was actually going to suggest that something is, uh, we, we work on something like that, because obviously greening of the town centre it, it requires, uh, you know, some input from councils and, uh, and, and uh, you know, but it also uh, uh, requires input from businesses themselves. And, you know, maybe some kind of, encouragement so uh, whether it's somebody working in the on the council who has goes around chatting to businesses on how to in, increase their sustainability uh, and, and be greener um, maybe that could through those uh, pathways we could get some kind of accreditation that we're we're you know we're following certain um, sort of uh, points and I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't I haven't heard of anything in specific. Um, I don't know if you know of anything. I don't, but I'm thinking that yeah, um, businesses like yours are, are a good example, and Gennaro's hair salon are a good example. Someone yes. who's really gone not the extra mile, but the extra hundred miles, yes. has shown that it's affordable and they can. It's really yeah. attractive and it's sort of in a holistic way, and that can inspire yeah. other businesses. But yeah, it would be good to find out. If Although, there is I mean, the thing is, my business is very small, and I think somebody made the point that you know, when you're a small business, you're chief cook and bottle washer and an accountant and everything else. Um, and it's easier to control all the elements of the business that you know, waste production, packaging food waste and in my case uh, being a cafe and, a, and a, a, a shop uh but of course as you get to larger businesses that that becomes more difficult and they often have to employ sustainability advisors to get that information and i just wondered if that could, that function could be uh something that came from the council um you know just having an officer maybe whose whose job is conservation or in a, some other uh, area of uh, of the environmental services uh, that could go around in this in the in the way that we have food safety uh, you know we obviously have to have um, our premises uh, you know inspected for food safety and in that same way something along those lines I think a lot of the time it's um, I mean I'm obviously committed environmentalist and I or you know and to me having a business that is basically enshrines these uh, uh, these ethics and policies is second nature to me. But for many, it, it is something that you know they probably need a little bit of advice and, and encouragement to do that. And a scheme where you could join and you could have a sticker on the window would actually, I think, be very encouraging for some of them. And I'm happy to help. You know, I mean, I, I probably my expertise wouldn't. 
uh, stretch to a large business, but certainly small business, I'd be very happy to help with my experiences at number 13. Great. Thank you, Rachel. So Poonam, you know where to go. Rachel's opposite St Paul's Church, <laughs> made in Bedford. And Henry, I think you were going to comment on that, perhaps about the council involvement. Well, I, I, I mean, in terms of council involvement, our revenue and our budget is unbelievably under pressure at the moment. So it's difficult to say anything like, you know, hugely positive there. But I, the, the, the comments and the um, links people shared in the chat were really helpful. I, I asked a question quite a way back, so it's probably disappeared into the ether. But um, Janara, I was just wondering, does the FSB have any kind of um, guidance on sustainability for small businesses as well? Because I wonder whether, I mean, if we needed to pilot something in Bedford, or if there was something we could say that was good in Bedford, I mean, Rachel, that sort of the idea of going and giving advice, I bet there are businesses in the town centre who would love to hear that advice um, where possible as well. So I just, sorry, that was my question, really. Yeah, I mean, they they are developing policies all the time and they are trying to adapt and make sure that it's all current and they want to try and help as many small businesses as possible. Um, and this is why we developed the special interest group as well, because we can respond to these things a lot more quickly um, without getting bogged down with, you know, with all the, the various uh, hierarchy. Um, so, yeah, there, I'm sure that there's something that we can um, feed in. If ever you need anything, Henry, just give us a shout and I'm sure we can provide stuff. Great, great that you two can be in touch and um, share knowledge. Um, so there have been a couple of questions about cycling, including cycling connectivity. And David says, how will you consult on cycling infrastructure? So, um, Henry, do you want to answer that first? Yeah, yeah, go on. I mean, in terms of major changes to cycling infrastructure, obviously there's a sort of set out consultation process, you know, a certain number of weeks and stuff like that and public notices and that sort of thing. In terms of some of the sort of... Um, rushed stuff I'm going to say I mean I think what, you, what you've probably noticed is with their first round of um, emergency COVID related funding for sustainable transport the government sort of got cold feet after I think people kicked back on one or two of the schemes that were introduced um, particularly actually there, there, there were there was there were streets in London that got closed and, and re regardless of your view on that debate if you like um, the next round this round that's forthcoming um, has a, a, a much um, more robust consultation requirement which I think is probably right um, um, in terms of sort of um, the cycling connectivity projects that are currently ongoing, if you like, um, that I've mentioned, they're largely based on the green wheel, I guess. So a lot of the signage is existing infrastructure, which is being sort of signposted or improved or a couple of drop curbs here and there to make it slightly easier for a cyclist to get around because nobody knows that there's this cycle route that's been there for apparently 20 years plus um, we've got the highways team checking and and it is an approved cycle route and it is a legal cycle route but it's just no, <laughs> no nobody remembers it's there I think um, so there, there, there are little bits of project like that which I think are taken as in hand almost um, but in terms of other proposals that come forward as well um, I I mean, there's a there's essentially a working list. Anyone can suggest anything at a full council meeting or at an executive meeting or by request, and it would go through the consultation process like any other um, scheme would. And some of the ones that were put forward as part of the town centre priority fund in the first round came directly from um, the campaign for cycling North Bedfordshire, um, so that they, they were a list of suggestions that came from them. And some of them weren't deliverable or weren't achievable in in the way that we might have liked, but some of them were obvious, like ex extending the cycle lane at least a little bit further down. Down Bromham Road, um, which you know, I no longer commute, so I no longer use it in quite the same way. But <laughs> okay, um, anything about cycling in Leighton Buzzard to add? Obviously, you're a much smaller town, and I'm guessing you've got a more pedestrianisation as well. I think, haven't you? Um, we 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 have. I uh, just just about we did. The, the main thing was we had a very pro we've got a very proactive group called Bus Cycles who work very, very closely with Central Bedfordshire Council. And that kind of, and we've, we've got a green wheel that's been adopted with plans. And so they can lobby the whole way through and they do doctor bike sessions. And particularly they're there at a lot of council meetings and they're very good at speaking at council meetings and lobbying. And it is amazing the way I have heard 
some councillors change what they are saying about pedestrianisation and cycle routes after hearing three good speeches in favour of cycling and none against it. It is quite amusing to listen to. So as I'm sure uh, Councillor Van will, will appreciate, but um, it sounds as if you've got a much, you've got a very open council in Bedford and that's something really good to to work with. And I, I just beg people to engage with councils. I, I know as a councillor, I would just love to have more emails about green issues than about potholes. I give the world for more on that subject. Thanks, Victoria. And a good reminder that, um, you know, for, in terms of Bedford Borough, you can go along to any meetings, you can ask questions, you can present petitions. Um, so look on the council website for the diary of meetings for whatever interests you. Um, so we've got quite a few questions about, I'm aware that we haven't got much time, but we've got quite a few questions about, um, this is particularly pertinent, pertinent in Bedford, all these big vacant properties because of big retail closures, the Arcadia Group, Debenhams, m and BHS, etc. Um, is there a plan for the larger chain shops that have gone out of business that may be hard to get new tenants for with a sustainability theme in mind? I mean, I think you have to look at it on a case by case basis with some of these large stores, clearly, because you can't um, necessarily. Um, well, if you come out publicly and say we have this plan or we will do this when you close, that can actually hasten the demise in many cases. And it's a real shame that Debenhams nationally has now um, collapsed, because to begin with, I'm sure you all remember prior to this um, additional lockdown, Debenhams in Bedford stayed open when Watford and Milton Keynes had closed. And we regarded that as a kind of vote of confidence in many ways in their store. Um, I think the way town centres are closing and the, and the way we need to support development in that sense is clearly going to be around um, smaller units as well. Um, there is actually, I mean, I, we, uh, those of us in Bedford, I suspect, probably know St Cuthbert's Arcade and the... Um, Yes, Sue's right. Sorry, there is a very good LGA publication, so do read it. Sorry, I'm getting sidetracked by the chat. Um, but um, St Cuthbert's Arcade has some very small units that have enabled some businesses to really get their um, get going in a way that they might not have done if there wasn't that tiny sort of space opportunity, if you like. Um, what I think we're missing in terms of the overall infrastructure, and this is what we're looking up in... Um, in uh, in the in the town centre element of the local plan, um, we're having a specific town centre policy for that. Is how we support the sort of inter intermediate, I guess, or the step up for those smaller businesses or the independents who want more space, who want to grow, who want to get somewhere, but without that, without such a step up to the business rates level that they'd end up paying, because we've talked about business rates already. So I think breaking stores up isn't the worst idea. Um, the other thing we do do, and we, you know, we have talked to the owners of the um, Devonham store, um, the owners of the Beale store. We do talk to owners of these units and try and have conversations with them around what their plans are. Um, so um, I wouldn't necessarily bring the library into that, Joanne, but um, we are talking to the owners about what their plans might be and what their plans for the future of that unit may well be. Um, so yes, um, in that sense. Um, so so, so we, we have those conversations. I mean, we had a conversation with Marks and Spencers as well. And the trouble with a lot of these units, I don't know if people probably know this as well, but they're often owned by a pension company or an equity firm, um, which doesn't have a particular interest in a thriving local Bedford town centre, if that makes sense. So we sometimes have to really push quite hard. Um, the old m and unit, um, as we'll know, has been bought and was bought a few months ago and is going to be filled. And so I'm really pleased about that. Um, clearly, the, the, the t change over time, if you like, say there are 100 properties on the high street, it's actually about 80 or something like that. If every five years there's a rent review, one of those is going to be empty, right? Um, as people, you know, rent might go up or people might choose to go elsewhere. And an empty shop can take three months to move on and then three months to resell as well. My understanding from the last conversation I had is that almost every, almost every, um, unit in the high street that's empty currently for example is under offer or has an occupier plan it's just you wouldn't move in there during the middle of a, <laughs> a third national lockdown i suspect so, so 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 there are promising signs of confidence for some of the smaller units but yes we do have conversations with the bigger developers as well as you'd expect and yes sustainability is, is, is an element in those conversations and yes david fisher oh. sorry i've been knocked off my bike before as well Thanks, Henry. Um, so we've got a question. This is um, for Bedford and for Leighton Buzzard, because I don't know what the situation is in Leighton Buzzard about um, 
refill schemes for um, water. So particularly water fountains, but also this is from Corey Walker from Refill Bedford. Um, I wondered if, Victoria, have you already got a scheme up and running in Leighton uh, Buzzers? I have to say, this is not me. This is um, the Conservative leader of the town council, Councillor Jones, was very keen on getting water fountains and the budget's been set aside from the town council We're going to have water fountains so people can refill their bottles in the main parks and in the high street so Excellent. that what's quite nice is that they they really leapt on that and uh, very enthusiastic and then covid happened but they that will come back Thanks, Victoria. Is um, what about in Bedford, Henry? I think there have been some conversations. I mean, Corey, you may um, know more about this than I do. Actually, um, I, I don't know whether you've had some conversations about that or whether you are able to come off mute. But um, there have been some conversations. My understanding of where they got to, um, in terms of having a number of places, was around um, revenue cost, cleaning, the additional pressure on the council finances, where we are financially, and all of that sort of thing. Um, Victoria, I would love to, if possible, um, see what those plans are, and if you want to email them to me, if I can, if I can, I presume as your councillor, I could probably find your email address online. So, um, but but it would be great to um, hear about how that's been achieved, because revenue cost is an issue at the moment. You know, we used to get thirty million pounds from central government we now get 5.9 million pounds from central government that's the reality of it um in terms of our revenue funding so that has affected council's capacity to do everything we would like thank you and as alice has pointed out below um, this is not a question but just a comment there are incredible cities with green initiatives um a few years ago i was in slovenia and every street corner seemed to have um in ljubljana every street corner seemed to have a water fountain and it was like 40 degrees and um, I had my own bottle, but it was a while before I realised, actually, these are water fountains on the corner. You can fill up your water bottle every half an hour. So, um, yeah, we don't have that heat quite here, but we are getting pretty hot summers. And also for rough sleepers, how amazing would it be to have for them to have easy access to water? Um, so we've got, I'm just scooting along, lots of great comments, but I'm just looking for questions before we finish, because we've just got a few minutes left. So. Hazira asked a question, maybe there's a lot of emphasis on getting people into town centres at the demise of elsewhere. What do you think about that? That may be not be such an issue in Leighton Buzzard that's smaller, but do, do you have neighbourhoods or Henry, what do you think? Do we have neighbourhoods that are suffering because um, resources are being focused on the town centre? It's a really interesting one. I mean, I think um, looking at the local plan and looking at the mapping of sort of you can actually look at the hierarchy of um, centers as well in a local plan that there, there i mean these are planning consultants and people who come up with i things that maps that I just think are amazing they're very colorful and tell you what kind of shops there are everywhere um, there are shopping parades and some of those are um, I mean I think they're actually doing very well out of the COVID pandemic in particular I think corner shops the sort of local businesses the smaller shopping parades have done quite well um, pushing people into the town centre. So I guess the example of that in Bedford recently, you might say in terms of a business moving would be something like the Eagle Bookshop, which did move from the Castle Road area into its new site on, on, the, on the north side of St. Peter's Street. I don't think it has to be a negative or a positive thing. And I guess um, encouraging um, retailers in the town, town centre doesn't necessarily have to conflict with those other centres. The one worth mentioning though, because my portfolio title on the council is town centres and planning um, and we shouldn't and we're a Bedfordshire wide thing so we shouldn't forget Kempston um, where there's all sorts of land ownership issues and who owns what in the sort of Saxon centre area if you know Kempston um, and that's all paved although the town council did some fantastic work funding planters um, and um, I had a meeting with Kempston borough councillors yesterday and we'll be meeting with the town council there to discuss proposals that can be built up to essentially bid for funding as well so that we're ready if the government says here's a future high streets fund you know Kempston could look at a element of green growth. Um, I know that that was one of the things the, the Kempston Borough Councillors said in that meeting was, you know, sustainability and green growth and that sort of thing was definitely there as something they wanted to um, to explore. So those options are there and it's looking at that because um, I sort of uh, I, I sort of see what Azira is saying. You need, you need, you need the whole town to be doing well, and you need to be supporting every local business wherever they're based. Um, so yes, I guess it's a discussion about what what town centres are of a piece. 
Okay, um, we have a, um, an interesting um, topic about the Library of Things. Corey's asked about a community hub to bring together various sort of sustainability groups in an empty unit, but also a library of things, which is, is something that's come up in discussion over the last few weeks where people can borrow tools or gardening equipment and all sorts of things in, in a sort of sharing economy way that they might not be able to afford or they might not need to be able need to buy because they're only going to use it once. Um, so um, I'm not, this isn't really Henry or Victoria's job to produce this, but um, or Gennaro's job indeed. But um, does anything like this exist in Leighton Buzzard? I know it doesn't in Bedford. There's a move for a, there's the starting plans for a repair cafe. And we've also got plans for um, an area in the town centre that needs to be developed. And I'm thinking a green hub as part of redevelopment would be really important because I think there might be streams of funding, particularly if it's linked to business. That's a kind of hunch. I mean, my feeling being in a council over revenue because income is so low in councils and that is such a terrifying problem. We don't, you are losing the people who can do the work in order to capture the green recovery and get things to happen. I think we as councils in this area need to desperately start supporting green businesses so that can bring in income. That's that's really the, the green jobs is, is the way that I think will keep councils afloat. That's what I'm praying for. And I'm lobbying every poor councillor in central Bedfordshire. Bye. Absolutely. We have we have a pop up quarterly well we did before COVID a quarterly repair shop, repair cafe in Bedford, yeah. which um, saved a lot of people money by often doing simple repairs and then teaching at the same time. This is what you do. Oh, Next time you just do this, you just need this little thing and this little tool. And um, obviously saved each time they would say, um, measure how many kilos of stuff they save from landfill. So they do it for a few hours on a Saturday and um, really great. Hopefully, hopefully that will be able to return after um, after this awful COVID has been got under control. Um, Pip asked a question. This is probably going to be one of my last questions I'm going to be able to ask, I'm afraid. This is from Pip. Does Bedford Council have a plan for the plastic waste washed up on the banks from the river flooding that can't be accessed by volunteers on foot? I know for a fact that Pip is out there with a litter pick stick <laughs> regularly, along with lots of other people during Not their mine as well. <laughs> exercise. They've been doing that. They've been going out with a stick while they take their exercise and collecting whole big bags of stuff before the flooding, but especially after it. What, what can we do about the, the plastics um, in the water that's a danger for wildlife? Apart from I think there's a response, a couple of posts or comments below that, um, which is that the boat um, uh, will be going out to clear it, I think. I saw that. It's a couple of posts below where, uh, where Pitt posted that. OK, great. I know I know Paul Pace said there is the resources and a plan to do that. Yeah. Um, but it's obviously a real hazard for um, wildlife and just um, looks awful. But the river is still really very high. It was a large bin. Yes, we sorry, know. Just, yeah. yeah. Um, maybe this should be the last question um because it's five past nine do amazon and any other pickup blockers help reduce the final miles of deliveries and bring footfall to the areas of a town center they're situated are they something that could bring a positive impact to a town center from digital trade depending on their placement victoria um i th i i think they could i think i think they really could um Gennaro's probably got something to say but m my dream because we're very much a commuter town is that they could be close to one of the local pubs and if you pick up something in the town centre you then might get a reduction a discount on your drink and I did get some interest from a couple of pub owners because I think that will be just a marvellous way if you're walking back from the train station to do your shopping but Gennaro's probably got stuff to say So yeah, um, the, these are all ideas that we've been um, looking at, and um, and definitely it's going to be it's everything's on the table in terms of looking at ways that people can attract footfall back into our town centres, 
and um, we will be speaking to as many of our businesses in our town and the ones that have the space that they can allocate for something like this and then can perhaps tailor their business service um, to benefit from that, as Victoria was saying, how some of the pubs could benefit from something like that, then this is something that we'll definitely be looking at as soon as we're able to do so once the um, lockdown is eased. Thanks, Gennaro. Um, I think we probably need to wind up. There are so many other questions and other themes, but hopefully you've been able to skim down and see the questions and comments that interest you. Lots of people have really helped other people with useful links and information. Um, we probably haven't done justice to the green spaces and the issues of trees and planting fruit trees and sort of community involvement in that. Several people have said sometimes it exists, but it's not it's not um, maybe looked after or, you know, community involvement seems something that we can really we can really look into green corridors likewise. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. It's been really great to have a good turnout. I think more than anything, this shows that that none of us are experts, but we all have input that we want to give and that we all care about our town centres. And lots of you have expertise on on really useful areas that we need to tap into more and that we can share. Um, so while you've got the opportunity, you might want to save the um, chat because there might be some links that you want to follow up and you can do that um, by, you probably noticed by now, but you can do that by the yellow, the three dots at the bottom right hand corner and you can save the chat. We're also recording as you know, so we will um, save that to the cloud and we will share that. We'll work out where to share it, probably on our website or on Facebook or Twitter or all of them, if we're able to do that. Um, but also keep in touch with each other. So there might be some people that you can see that you can message and say, I want to do this project too. I want to tap into your knowledge about this. Um, if, you, if you're happy to share emails. Um, I'm also going to email you all um, in the next few days um, and ask if anyone would like to join our mailing list. Quite a few of you are on our mailing list already, but if you're not, I can add you, but obviously I have to ask you for permission to do that. So if you don't answer me, then I won't add you to the email list. That probably goes without saying. And anyway, thank you very much. Thank you so much for Victoria and Gennaro for coming all the way from Leighton Buzzard. It's been great to have you. Isn't this the great thing about digital? Because it would have been a real trek and not really viable for you to do that for the evening. So this is one positive thing. And thank you, Henry, for coming after meeting and singing as well. We really appreciate it <laughs> and your, your positive can-do attitude. And thank you everyone else for coming and we will be back the second Wednesday all being well of March um, for an event around food and regenerative agriculture and that is to be confirmed but if you're on our emailing list, you will hear about that. Thank you very much everyone. Thank you. Thank you.